in terms of thinking about trauma and development, um, I, I'd like to highlight a couple of things. We, we have uh, D David, uh, David Hong is part of a group of uh, people around the state who are involved in a learning collaborative, uh, a group of mental health providers who are interested in learning evidence-based trauma treatment. And the, our consultant on this project uh, is, uh, her name is Jennifer Wilgocki, and she lives in um, Dane County, Wisconsin. And she, uh, she, she put out some principles of trauma that I just thought were so nice, I keep repeating them. Um, and the first one is, with, a, with, with trauma, it's what's traumatizing, of course, is not the event itself, but the child's experience of the event. And that's the key issue. And that's why the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders requires a certain reaction in order to diagnose post-traumatic stress disorder, which is that the, the event has to have been perceived um, as overwhelming, and the person has to have displayed helplessness or panic or other overwhelmed reactions. The second thing is that the kinds of adaptations that traumatized children make um, in order to survive are absolutely brilliant and are adaptive in the moment, but later show themselves to be very costly. Um, the kinds of ways in which kids adapt in order to avoid being abused, for example, are absolutely show in ingenuity and brilliance often when you think about a three-year-old or a four-year-old or a six-year-old, but that, they come back to haunt them afterwards. Um, the third one is if you, don't, <laughs> if you don't ask, they won't tell, which is uh, a truism about trauma, which is um, related to the issue that I mentioned earlier around under-identification, which is that traumatic events are not things that people like to talk about. In fact, one of the hallmarks of post-traumatic stress disorder is avoidance. We have a whole cluster of avoidance symptoms. Um, in fact, just yesterday, I was meeting with someone who was telling me about a really uh, a traumatic incident. Um, she she found her mother had died, and she was the one who discovered the body. And she said, I can't, um, I can't talk about it. People don't want to hear about it. But I keep rerunning it. It's like a movie in my mind. I keep thinking about it again and again and again. And what I asked her to do, um, and David will talk more about it, is tell me all about it, all the details. Um, but if you don't ask, they won't tell. Um, and then if we don't look for... Um, or acknowledge the presence of trauma in children's lives, what we'll end up doing is chasing, chasing behavior problems. And um, it's, not, it's not the topic of our discussion today, but one of the big issues um, that many providers are aware of is that there's so much under-identification of trauma in the lives of kids, and um, so many children are misdiagnosed or mislabeled as being behavior problems. Um, that um, actually in November I was asked by the state to do a workshop on assessing trauma in children. Maybe some of you were, were there. It was over at Earl Brown on the university campus. And um, we talked specifically about this, this problem in mental health that conduct, and behavior, conduct uh, disorder and oppositional defiant, defiant disorder are very common and very out there kinds of um, problems. You know, a kid acts up, you have a label for what they're doing. Um, and somebody told me a, a very clear example of this. A little boy who was expelled from school because he was attacking kids on the playground. And he, he would just start fights with kids. And finally the school said, we can't deal with this kid. And they expelled him as being a behavior problem. Well, when somebody went into the playground and, and looked and observed the child's behavior, what they found was that the, children was, the child was only attacking boys who were wearing yellow jerseys. Well, the child had been the witness to an extremely horrifying and violent event at home where the perpetrator had been wearing a yellow jersey. And that was the child's trauma trigger. And we know PTSD, and we know this more clearly, it's documented with adults with post-traumatic stress disorder, particularly veterans, but the reaction to a trauma trigger can be many things, one of which is aggression. And so we, we, it sort of, I, I always, you know, it, it's a reminder to me always to just think more deeply when, um, when we're thinking about this issue. 
Um, in the short term, I'm going to start with the sort of short term general um, kinds of things that you see across development. But what we see as a result of a short term of exposure to, to trauma in the short term is acute disruptions in self-regulation. Why? Uh, think about a child who just witnessed the near murder of his mother, a young child. Um, I, all my examples are taken from real cases that we've seen in Minneapolis or elsewhere. A child who witnessed his mother stabbed multiple times. She lived, only just. And there was blood all over the house. And the child, when the child was first seen, the child had blood on his T-shirt. And one of the first things that the, that the therapist, the clinician who saw the child did was to suggest that he find him a clean shirt. The child experience, the child is completely overwhelmed and in the moment is um, frozen or um, completely, you know, so many police officers tell me that kids just have blank looks on their faces and sometimes people who don't know say, oh, you know, they're used to it. You know, you go into a house and three kids are watching television and there's blood everywhere and they say, oh, you know, police officers who really, in my experience, so want to help children feel so helpless and they say, oh, the kids are used to it. So, you know, but of course, what, you know, what we know is it's the kind of um, freeze response or total shutdown denial. In the short term, what you see is that all the body's self-regulatory capacities are thrown out of whack. And so you see disruptions in the kinds of things, normal daily routines that require different elements of self-regulation. That includes for young children who are toilet trained, you know, toilet issues. Um, for er kids of all ages, sleep um, disruptions, um, disruptions in eating, um, inability to attend or concentrate on things, extreme fearfulness, um, withdraw you know, withdrawal from people, not being, not being able to sort of communicate. And then the kinds of things that look very much like later post-traumatic stress disorder, so those would include re-experiencing, flashbacks, um, avoidance of anything that might remind the child in any way of what happened, and then aggression. Um, so as a function of being so helpless, the child attempts to turn their, um, their passive helplessness in the event into something active and will either say or do things that are very aggressive, i.e., I wasn't that helpless. I'm going to show how I really could have beat the guy up or um, something like that. And then um, disruptions to relationships and partial memory loss, which is quite common in the wake of a traumatic event. And those are kind of across the board acute disruptions in self-regulation. Over the long term, those, um, those, there are many chronic developmental adaptations, including depression, anxiety, post-traumatic stress disorder, changes in personality as a function of exposure to, to trauma, substance abuse and perpetration of violence. And here the concept of multifinality is important, and that describes how one stressor can have many different implications depending on all the other things that come in between. So one stressor being exposure to a traumatic event or traumatic events can have many different developmental implications depending on so many other factors in the context with family, peers, uh, you know, history, other stresses that come along, things like that. And, of course, these adaptations maybe uh, lead to a diagnosed disorder or maybe not. So let's first look at infants and young children. Um, what, we, what do we expect from infants and young children? Well, we expect that they need protection and nurturing. Um, we expect that they need reliability, consistency, and love in caretaking. And, um, and we expect adults, caregivers, to respond to situations of uncertainty by protecting children, young children, very young children. So I'm talking about kids under the age of two now. Caregiving, of course, the parent-child relationship is the basis for what we'd like to see, which is secure attachments. And in the majority of kids who live um, typical lives, we see... Um, we see securely attached parent uh, infants in, um, in, in good child-parent relationships. Um, kids who are highly stressed, infants and very young children who are highly stressed, show 
um, show the kinds of things that they can show given their developmental stage. So I've already talked about disturbances in basic self-regulatory capacities. Those include disrupted sleep, disrupted eating, even among kids, or particularly, you know, among kids who previously showed no disruptions or showed certain habits in eating and sleeping. Um, a sort of a, an agitation that can m manifest in constant crying or an inability to be soothed. So a child who was previously, you know, had a routine, parent knew how to soothe them, um, now can't be soothed, is agitated and more generalized fears. What we see in very young children is that there's not a one-on -ma one mapping. You know, in older kids, we see fears that are associated with some trigger of the traumatic event. And in very young children, what we see, the research shows that we see more generalized fears um, that could be sort of extensions of stranger anxiety or separation anxiety depending on the developmental stage. You know, these kick in at different ages of um, infancy and early childhood. And so we can see avoidance of situations that may have nothing to do with the trauma and we don't really understand what's driving avoidance of certain situations in very, very young children. Sometimes it seems logical and sometimes it doesn't. Um, when, we, when we look at preschoolers, you know, 18 month to three year old or, you know, uh, toddlers maybe is a better term for those, you know, one and a half to three year olds, we think about children who have increased capacities in language development, cognitive development, you know, the ability to begin to look beyond the complete egocentric, you know, ego, egocentric, you know, boundaries of me and me and me and parent. Um, they are beginning to have struggles around separation and what we call, you know, individuation. One beautiful example in normal develop, you know, typical development is the is the you know, kid who's learning to, who's, who's walking and, you know, literally toddling, um, gets up. What's the, one of the first things that a, that a toddler does when they walk? They, they run away. <laughs> you know, they, they, they you, know, mu, you know, mom or a parent sitting down and the kid gets up and walks away and then they fall over. Ah, what's the first thing they do? Mama. So, um, so the struggle, of course, for, uh, you know, toddlers is between, you know, learning that you're a separate being from your parent and then sort of learning about the bounds of me and other people. And so the independence piece is being able to walk and, and, and run away or being able to talk and what's the first word usually? No, right? And, um, and being able to assert independence, but in times of trouble, always coming back to the secure base or having the secure base come to them. And so... You know, those are particular typical tasks, just beautiful. It's lovely to see them play out in, in, in toddlerhood. And they're a function, of course, of the increased cognitive capacities of that age. Um, but when there's anxiety, um, these kids run straight back into mom's arms, of course, because that's what the attachment relationship is there for. It's there to help children regulate. Because at this age, kids can't regulate themselves yet. And that's why, and you know, we'll talk a little bit about things like discipline and timeout later, but the idea is that your attachment figure is going to help you with that, your, your worry about strangers or whatever happens. So when we think about um, these, this age child in the context of this overwhelming traumatic event, what's happened? Fundamentally, the child's world has been sort of devastated by the fact that they relied on their attachment figure to protect them, and that person wasn't able to protect them. And that's a pretty devastating thing, um, given the power of the attachment figure. So um, it's not, it's, then it's not surprising in light of that to think about attachment difficulties as one of the correlates of exposure to traumatic events. And there's been, very, there's been a little bit of um, research on this. And of course, you know, one of the difficult things is teasing out events that are clearly caregiver-related, like abuse, 
or exposure to domestic violence, and of course, abuse is the extreme case where it's the caregiver who's perpetrating the traumatic event versus, say, domestic violence where the per perpetrator may be the victim. So the child may see a parent who is not only unable to protect them but also being injured um, themselves versus a natural disaster or something like that. So these, this is where these kinds of distinctions are very important to understand. You'll see agitated motor behavior or extreme passivity. You could see one or the other. The kids who, you know, my, um, you know, my police colleagues have described them as they, they run around like the Energizer bunny when you get to the home, like the kids sort of just complete, uh, you know, just un uncontrollable um, agitation in terms of running around. Or the opposite, which was the kids I described to you were just completely um, zoned out. Um, extreme passivity. Then, of course, you see eating, the sleeping disturbances, and inconsolable crying is also a hallmark of this stage. Um, when we think about children who are a little bit older, so now we're really looking at um, the transition to school age, preschoolers into kindergarten, um, maybe first grade. What's beautiful, I think, what is so beautiful about this stage is the use of play as a way to kind of figure things in the world out, play is children's work. And it's not the kids don't play before this, of course they do, but this is the age where you really see play as a way to express feelings and ideas, where you, you know, you see the little kid with the doll or the monkey and disciplining the, disciplining the monkey for doing something or putting them in school or fi figuring stuff out that way. You see vastly increased cognitive capacities, language development, all the way through from toddlerhood is quite remarkable, and an increased sophistication of language to communicate ideas. You see a little bit less action, so you see a little bit less impulsivity. You know, we think about how we teach children self-regulation in you know, parent-child relationship, where first, really, the parent really manages the child's regulation. And then slowly the child is taught to be able to manage the, their bodies and their behaviors themselves. And that's why, you know, for example, you know, time out is a very um, well-used tool and the uh, parent is teaching the child, if you can't control your own behavior and it is unacceptable, you know, the 20-month-old, the this is one of my favorite um, this is one of my favorite examples, you know, the 20-month-old who, who gets angry with another kid and takes a chunk out of their arm, you know, biting is unacceptable. And so if you can't control yourself and not bite, then here's the consequence. I'm going to put you somewhere where you won't be, you know, show you the timeout chair where you, you know, need to be able to take some time. And we teach children that way to that if they can't control their own behavior, we will help them do that. And, and gradually, the idea is that they become more and more in control. It's facilitated by cognitive and emotional development, of course, and also by the, the development of the caregiver-child relationship that, that assists this. Um, we see more of a distinction between reality and fantasy. You know, the kids who, um, I don't know if any of you have read the book, There's a Nightmare in My Closet, one of my favorite therapy books. Uh, there are many like that, but the idea that, you know, I know, I, I kind of know now that monsters don't exist, but that, that still doesn't mean I'm not scared of the monster under my bed. Um, and, and so this is really um, a beautiful stage, but a stage that is really focused on distinguishing between reality and fantasy, being able to take less action, and still working on self-control. Ah, I know a lot of adults who are still working on self-control, so... <laughs> Um, so what happens when uh, these, these kind of transition to school age kids are exposed to st stress and trauma? Well, regression is a hallmark again at all stages, but here what we see is kids who've previously attained certain developmental milestones may lose them. So you may see a kid who hasn't, uh, you know, who's had a dry, you know, who's been dry in bed for the last two years, and then they wet the bed. That's very, very common. Um, or... Um, Preoccupation with words or symbols that might or might not be related to the trauma. Again, it's this idea that in adults and older kids, we, we can always find some connection between the preoccupation and the fears after the traumatic event and something to do with the experience during the traumatic event. But with very young children, we can't always figure that out. But we do see post-traumatic play, and this is play in which the themes of the trauma are repeated again and again and again. And some of you who do play therapy or um, work with children may see this. Um, 
Nightmares are very common. Temper tantrums as a reaction are also pretty common. Um, I can give you an example of post-traumatic play because I, I figure that um, David gets the fun of, of offering a case example, so I get to smatter a few of them. Um, I had a little four-year-old girl with whom I worked about 10 years ago when I was living on the East Coast who had been um, really, really adverse um, environment, had, um, had um, she and her brother were living with their mother who um, was an injection drug user and was uh, prostituting in order to um, be able to support her drug habit. Um, and we don't know what the kids were exposed to during that time. We can only imagine the tragedy is that she was removed from her home and placed in a foster placement where her foster father sexually abused her. And the abuse occurred in the bath and bathtub. And what was so you know, sad, and any of you who work with kids exposed to sexual abuse know this about sexual abuse, is that sexual abuse can be but doesn't have to be um, a, you know, uh, violent in the traditional sense of the term. And this foster father led her to believe that she was a princess and he was providing her with attention that she'd never had in her life. And so actually, you know, and this makes therapy very complicated because she perceived the attention she got as positive, even though it was, she, he was very abusive. Well, for the first several months in therapy, she would re recreate the same scene over and over again. And it was a scene, it was very, you know, the bathtub, the kid, the father. And, um, you know, the hallmark of this play was that she could never resolve it. And what's beautiful, and this is the difference between post-traumatic and spontaneous play, which is that in spontaneous play, kids use play to resolve problems. There's always a resolution. It might not calm immediately. But there is a resolution. There's a trying of different things. That's why we call it spontaneous. In post-traumatic play, the same thing is repeated over and over again. You, it's like, a, it's like a, feed, a closed feedback loop um, until the trauma is resolved. Um, so let's move on and look at school-age kids. Um, these are kids who um, rely less on cues from their caretakers. They're more in the outside world. They understand situations of potential threat. This is where, you know, I'm not really going to talk much about the media, but these are kids who come home from school and who, um, you know, who may overhear, hear the news in the car or watch the television and see what's going on. And they're all too aware of situation, dangerous situations and threatening situations. They invoke fantasies of superhuman powers to protect themselves. It's the most beautiful thing. This is... Um, this is, uh, you know, very typical. You know, you think about the popularity of superheroes. I can't even keep up with the new generation of superheroes, so I'm not even going to try. But superheroes play a very important function for children. Um, and I'll give you a quick example later that demonstrates it. Mastery and control is also becoming very important. This is a, a basic human adaptational system. Um, the idea that you feel competent and become competent in something, and that makes you feel better and that grows you. And school, of course, is an important, an important um, way through which children, um, children's mastery, we call it mastery motivation system, works. That's what's supposed to happen at school. You do well, you know, you do, you do your work in school, you do well, you do the things you're supposed to be doing, and you become intrinsically um, um, interested and grow through those experiences. There's more emphasis on separating. Of course, you are outside the home more. Um, emphasis on development of self-esteem, um, and then and language development, and more energy directed towards um, learning in school and being involved in peer activities, sports, things like that. And then, um, you know, increasing amounts of self-control. We expect more of older children. We expect them to be able to control their behavior, um, to manage themselves. We give them more independence. And uh, we also see an increased um, awareness of the distinction between reality and fantasy. You know, this is the time where parents are devastated because their children stop believing in the tooth fairy or in Santa Claus. It's so sad. Um, some children continue to hold on. Um, I had a really long conversation with my school-aged child the other day about the tooth fairy and how tooth fairies get trained um, and the kinds of tools they use and what happens to all the teeth. Um, but, uh, you know, this is a fragile time for fantasy and reality. Um, 
What happens to kids of school age who are traumatized? Well, the outside world is supposed to be a safe place. That's the premise on which we all go, grow up and get, get through our lives. In very early childhood, we totally rely on our caregivers for it. As we get older, we rely on all the other people around us who, um, who we expect to be able to shepherd us through and keep our world safe. That's a very, very, very important notion. And um, what, you know, I, I think about the 9-11 terror attacks, um, how many children needed to know that their world was safe in, against the backdrop of watching planes fly into buildings again and again and again and again. And um, that's, all the kid, that's what kids need to know. They need to know their world is safe. And when a child's world has been shown to be unsafe, um, then it's hard to tell a child and have them believe that their world is safe. Um, and so the kinds of adaptations that school-age kids make to a traumatic experience are, of course, in the context of what they're doing at that developmental stage. So disruptions in academic performance, lying, stealing, fighting, the beginning of so-called delinquent, you know, things that we are so quick to label, delinquent behaviors, sleeping and eating disturbances, and then we still see, you know, and of course it's going to depend on the individual child, clinging, clinginess, so something that, you know, from some, one, one, is, one issue that often comes up with kids, and I've seen this in the context of domestic violence, is children who won't go to school, school refusal. Well, if you take the time to find out what's going on, the child is absolutely terrified of what will happen to their mother if they go to school. But what happens from the school end is that it's labeled as truancy or straight, you know, school refusal, some behavioral problem, and, and, um, and then it's, you know, of course, the further out from the traumatic event the child's identified, the harder it is. You know, it takes a little bit more digging to find out what's been going on. Um, um, and then false bravado, the kids who deal with their helplessness by saying, I can, you know, I'll, next time he comes round, I'll blah. And that, of course, we'll talk, I'll give you a case example in adolescence that really brings that home. Um, I, can, um, I can give you a quick school age. I'm kind of out of whack with timing, but um, I think we said you'd, we'd, we'd go through, we had, I'd have till about quarter to 11, 11. Is that right? Yeah? 11. Good. Okay. Good, good. Um, so um, when I was in New Haven a, a, more than 10 years ago now, there was a really sort of horrendous incident with a, um, a group of uh, young kids on a school bus. Um, the school bus, it was actually a, um, a kindergarten first, I think it was kindergarten school bus that was um, coming home from half-day kindergarten New Haven at the time was really dealing with a drug problem and a gang problem in its streets, um, with rival with warfare between rival drug uh, gangs, and this school bus with about 15 kindergartners rounded a, a corner to drive down the first street where the first child would be dropped off, and um, the bus was literally caught in the crossfire between gangs on opposite sides of the street. Shots fired through the bus, and one of the little uh, boys in the kindergarten um, was shot in the head. And um, I always get goosebumps when I tell this story, so I have to tell you immediately that fortunately the kid survived and he recovered, and it was really a remarkable tale of resilience. But um, the, if you can just imagine the scene, um, complete chaos, 15 kindergartners, Glass, blood, screaming everywhere, and a little boy who's totally incapacitated. A school bus driver was really had the, you know, really had his wits about him. Called 911. Immediately uh, turned around and went right back to the school, which was just about two blocks away. And the school, uh, the, the the paramedics took the child away, and the other kids were taken off the school bus to wait in the gymnasium for their parents. And in the time that it took for the parents to come, a team of uh, my colleagues from uh, the Yale Child Study Center in New Haven, Connecticut, came to be with the children. And of course, as you can imagine, the kids were in shock. 
And if you can just think about the kinds of experiences they had just had. Um, the clinician sat with them and um, just, you know, said it's what we would always say when we saw kids who'd just been through something horrendous, which was, you've just been through some, a terrible thing has just happened. A really awful thing has just happened. So, you know, if we think about avoidance, we're not going to say, oh, you're safe now, everything's better, forget about that, because that kind of reinforces you. But a really terrible thing just happened. Does anyone want to, you know, does, does anyone want to say anything? No. The clinicians had with them, they had the kids in little groups of about four children, and they had pens and paper, and they said, does anyone want to draw anything? Or No. And then one of the kids said, I want you to draw. So the therapist said, okay, and drew a circle. And then the kid said, okay, I want you to draw another circle. And basically the child directed, and then other children joined in, they directed the clinician to draw a person. And then the clinician drew a bubble coming out of their mouth. And what do you think the bubble might have said? I don't know if I'm allowed. In, are we allowed interaction here? Can we do that? <laughs> what do we, take a guess about what do you think the bubble might have said? What do you think the person might have been thinking? Screams or something? I'm sorry? Help? Actually, the, 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 the figures were the children's parents. So it turns out that the figures were adults, and they were thinking, I can't believe I let Johnny go on the school bus this morning. I really, I'm going to be with him any minute. I'm on my way to get him. I'm coming to. So real, actually, what was really interesting is this, the, our um, human tendency to, to survival <laughs> rather than, you know, even it's so soon after. So then this one child says, he turns to the therapist, he says, Look at me. I'm so strong. And then another kid says, hey, look at me. Look at these muscles. Come on, feel these muscles. They're so strong. And then a third, you know, then all the kids join in. Yeah, I'm really, I can do this. So on the theme of continuing the theme, what do you think the kids were trying to say? And this is really remarkable. And think about it in the developmental context that we just talked about. Right. I have superpowers. We all think when we drive past, I, I challenge anyone to tell me that when you, don't drive, when you drive past an accident on the highway, you don't think, there but for the grace of God go I. Right? It's terrifying. Things are very arbitrary. So imagine, so these kids trying to deal with this thought. That could have been any one of us in there. So how do they protect themselves with superpowers? I am like this, that couldn't have happened to me. And it's a very natural protective mechanism that is a beautiful developmental sort of uh, very sort of very, very developmentally appropriate that these kids were saying, hey, you know, now's the time I'm going to invoke superpower, uh, you know, superpower protections because that was so darn terrifying. I can't even think about what it would have been like if that might have been me. So very interesting uh, developmentally. Uh, let's move on and talk about that thorny period in our lives, adolescence. Oh, I'm sorry, I had one more one more age slide, one more school age slide that I didn't um, that I didn't put on. So uh, one other issue about um, school age, and this is a little technical, but kids of school age often experience what we call time skew and omen formation regarding trauma, which is that um, uh, kids miss sequence trauma events when they're recalling the memory, and I know there's a whole literature on memory for traumatic events. Um, and the other thing is omen formation that you'll, I think it's probably very common, you'll see this uh, for those of you who are in clinical practice, the idea that there were warning signs that preceded the trauma. Something happened that day. Dad wore that shirt, and I knew that was a bad luck shirt, or something like that. Um, and, and so, the problem is that as a result of that, kids might believe that if they're alert enough, they'll recognize the next warning sign, which of course, you know, is a way of protecting themselves against the arbitrary nature of some of these terrible things. And we talked a little bit about post-traumatic play and also about uh, reenactment. Um, so I won't spend much, 
reenactment is a variant of post-traumatic uh, play uh, where the child recreates um, some aspects of the trauma. Uh, an example would be uh, carrying a weapon after the child's been exposed to violence. Um, let's talk a little bit about adolescence, um, and then um, um, I'll give you a, a, a small example. So uh, this thorny period of adolescence, um, let's, I've divided into, into um, puberty or early adolescence and mid-adolescence. Um, again, this is very distinctive in terms of developmental stage and what we expect to see. We see um, both bodily, physical changes, and we see psychological um, parallels to those um, physical changes. A preoccupation with a child's body is very, very common. A sense of distinctiveness. Nobody really understands what I'm going through. Um, change in relationship with the parents. We sometimes call this the second stage of separation individuation. And having one myself, I believe that adolescents are like toddlers in more ways than one. Uh, it's just the no is a little bit more sophisticated. Um, but there's this idea that, you know, there's, of course, the normal, you know, the, the, the typical way of developing is that adolescence is the beginning of that real identity formation and se separation um, and becoming an individual. And of course, there's an increase, uh, a huge increase in um, the influence of peers on, on adolescence. So how does that, what happens when children of this age are exposed to stressful or, tra you know, traumatic events? Um, one is a feeling of inadequacy. You know, you have this very you know, emphasis, this self-absorption of adolescence, and then terrible feelings of either inadequacy or unrealistic feelings of guilt, particularly in the context, say, um, where a child feels, uh, say, in the context of an assault or domestic violence, where the child really believes that they could have done something to protect their mother, for example, or to protect whoever was the victim. Um, you see an exaggerated preoccupation with the body, and... So that could mean that the child, instead of saying, you know, I just can't get thoughts out of my mind, will say, I think there's something wrong with my heart, where it's, you know, there won't be any physical thing found. It's a somatic, you know, sort of somatic acting out. And then you have acting out in unsafe ways, in terms of unsafe sex, or delinquency, or drugs, or early pregnancy. And that's, of course, a huge risk in adolescence. So one of the problems, one of the, one of the danger points in terms of exposure to trauma is that in adolescence, when kids act out, they can do a lot more harm because of the um, decreased monitoring of kids of this age, because of their increasing access to things like drugs, because they can get themselves pregnant girls, etc. cetera. Um, if we think about later in adolescence, we think about mid to late adolescence, what we're seeing is, you know, the developmental goals are to really create, you know, create an identity, develop an identity that has been formed throughout development. But this is sort of the revival and the culmination. And then both sexual and aggressive urges, as well as other, you know, developmental um, uh, components, foster autonomy and independence. What you what you sometimes get, and any of you who has had interaction with adolescents knows that you often get adult physical and cognitive maturation without the emotional element. So you've got these kids who look like adults, who sometimes behave like adults, but don't have the prefrontal cortex functioning to be emotional, to have the emotional capacity or, um, to really behave like adults. And that's when we get into trouble with things like drinking and driving and, uh, um, you know, impulsive urges, getting kids into trouble. This is called the second opportunity to, um, you know, for, uh, for um, separation and individuation where the, ch the goal is to be able to uh, develop a, a, a cohesive, coherent identity. What happens to, to um, adolescents who are traumatized is that um, the regression, remember we've talked about regression a number of times, so these kids end up acting as if they were younger children. And then another problematic aspect of traumatization in adolescence is that because of the lack of you know, prefrontal development sort of, or the, um, the sort of mismatch of prefrontal cortex development with development in, say, the physical realm, is that you have 
Children come to inadequate solutions that can be potentially dangerous both to themselves and other people. And I'll give you an example of that um, in a second. But the other problem is that um, the, the second opportunity for separation and individuation is experienced as threatening. And nowhere was that more clear to me than in the example of one of the first families that we went to visit in the context of our police project here in Minneapolis, which was a very, um, it was a, a, a family where the, um, the, the two children were older than we typically see. There was a 17-year-old um, girl and a 15-year-old boy, and the mother had experienced abuse for about 12 years and had only ever called the police once before. And on this occasion, um, they went out to buy a prom dress for the girl, the mom and the daughter. And when they returned, the father was drunk and wielding a knife and threatened to kill the mom. And he was literally, he was advancing up the steps from the basement with a knife in hand. The daughter called 911 and the cops showed up. And when we met with them afterwards, the daughter said that the mother invited us in and said that they had never, ever discussed, ever talked about the violence as a family before. The father was arrested. It was the mother and the two children. And she said they'd never, ever talked about it. And the daughter was able to say something to her mother, which is very reflective of what I've just talked about here, which was that um, she had been given a scholarship been offered a scholarship to study out of state. Um, and she said, I've, turn, I've decided not to take the scholarship because I'm too scared to leave you, because I worry that if I leave you, he's going to kill you. And, um, you know, this is clearly uh, an example of the idea that this final opportunity to be able to separate is disrupted by the experience of trauma and in this case, the ongoing threat and the feeling that the child had to be there in order to save her mother's life. Um, in adolescence, um, post-traumatic stress disorder symptoms are commonly you know, much closer to those of adults. Um, you still do see those some traumatic play and traumatic reenactment, but they are more likely than even younger children or adults to exhibit impulsive and aggressive behaviors. And I just want to give you one more case example. I talked about this, um, these um, um, inadequate solutions that can be physically dangerous. Um, I was once asked to evaluate a young, a young man. He was 14, almost 15 years old. He had been arrested for um, a, a case of assault in which he had thrown his mother's boyfriend down the stairs, breaking several of his ribs. And he was in the juvenile detention center, and I was asked to interview him um, as a part of a cohort of kids with who, about whom the, um, the judges in the juvenile court didn't know what to do uh, because they were, they were noticing an increasing number of what they call juvenile domestic violence offenders, so uh, young kids, mainly boys, who were assaulting family members. Well, so it turned out that this boy... Um, was actually really the man of the house, had been in control of the house pretty much as long as he could remember. His mom was an immigrant. She did not speak much English. As a result, he screened all her phone calls and all her mail. Um, he translated for her, and he pretty much was in control. Um, she had had a series of relationships with men, um, almost all of whom had been abusive. And he had decided um, when he was pretty young that when he was old enough, he was going to make sure she was protected and she was never going to be harmed again. And she hadn't been in a relationship, in this relationship, for very long. Um, but after an argument um, one day where he heard his mother and her boyfriend raise their voices, he decided that this was it. He had had it. And he was going to get rid of this boyfriend. And that result, of course, that, that decision, of course, resulted in him um, being put in juvenile detention with a charge against him. And so I think, unfortunately, that's a good example of these kind of inadequate solutions that seem very logical to the kids at the time. Um, so having, talked, having sort of taken you through this whistle-stop whistle tour of development, um, of course, in addition to age and developmental stage, there are many other factors that mediate a child's response to a traumatic event. We talked a little bit about the history 
of the trauma and what, the, of course, the meaning of the trauma, the nature of the child's exposure to the event, how severe the event was, how close the child was to the event, and, of course, the child's own internal resources, emotional and cognitive resources, for mediating anxiety related to real and imagined dangers. And here's where things like temperament become very important because we know that children of different temperaments manage things very, very differently and interpret things very differently. And so, for example, children whose temperament is, um, we know that there are children whose temperament makes them more vulnerable to anxiety. And those are the kids who are going to be more worried about in the context of traumatic events because, of course, PTSD is an anxiety disorder. And so we're going to really, we need to take these things into account. Parenting, of course, one of my favorite topics. But parenting, social support, and what happens around the child is absolutely a critical mediating factor. And unfortunately, we tend, the trauma research has tended to pay not enough attention to um, parenting and um, uh, social support in the wake of trauma. Much more, uh, there's a focus on, are kids vulnerable to getting post-traumatic stress disorder if their parents have had post-traumatic stress disorder? Uh, rather than what I would say is much more logical, which is to say the parents provide the environment in which the child grows up. There are practices, there are definitely parenting practices that contribute to the child's feeling from attachment onwards, from when the child is a newborn onwards, of security and safety, or the opposite, of the ability, of the understanding that the child's world is safe and secure, or the opposite. And so these are things that I hope that our next generation of trauma researchers will really um, help us pay attention to. Um, here's what we're going to do. I think if it's OK with you, David, we talked a little bit about this. We're in fairly good time. I think that we should maybe take a break, at, uh, a, a 10 minute break at 11. Is that okay? Otherwise, you guys are going to be sitting here and everyone in Greater Minnesota for about another hour and a half, and I just worry about you. So, so why don't we go on for about another t till 11, and, um, and then we'll take a 10 minute break. We'll come back. David will present um, the case example, and we'll, and we'll go on. Okay. So, we've got 10 more minutes to break, so hang on. You can do it. Um, <laughs> So, um, so I just want to spend 10 minutes talking a little bit about how we screen and assess traumatized kids, and I'll beg your forgiveness for not spending longer on this, um, but um, I feel like we need to spend longer on the, on the meaty issues of how we actually provide services to kids who are traumatized. Um, Screening is an initial tool to identify kids who need further attention. It's not a diagnostic tool. It's more of a public health approach. I know there are, there's at least one public health person, probably more um, among, the, among the 900 people who are, who are here in, um, in Spirit or ITV today. Um, but um, it's, it's, it's straightforward, and it's a way to... Um, to be able to identify the kids who are in trouble and need a little bit more help. And what's neat about screening is that it doesn't require a mental health professional to administer, although depending on the tool, it may require a mental health professional to interpret. So um, in contrast, assessment is a more detailed process, diagnostically oriented, it could include structured interviews, self-reports, observational, multi-informant, multi-method data. I'm interviewing, if I'm working with a child, I'll want to hear from the parents, the teacher. I might want to do a school observation, depending on who I am and in what context I'm working, usually completed by a mental health professional. And the product is a case formulation, diagnosis, and treatment plan. So this is sort of stage two. Um, I just, just a couple of notes on the reporting of trauma exposure and symptoms. Sorry, the thing got cut off at the top. One is um, that what we see time and again is um, we see when we ask children themselves, which, by the way, for any kid over the age of seven, seven is kind of on the border depending on the child's cognitive capacity, you should always ask the child what we know about symptoms of distress is that they're much more reliably reported by a child than by a parent or someone outside the child. That's not necessarily the case with behavioral problems, but with post-traumatic distress, you should, you should be asking children themselves. 
But not surprisingly, given that denial or avoidance is a correlate of post-traumatic stress disorder, expect to see some underreporting and some fear of disclosure and some shame and stigma around talking about what happened. Underreporting is well documented by caregivers, um, probably associated with guilt, um, with denial, and with very pragmatic concerns about child protection involvement. We finished a study a couple of years ago where we were interested in understanding the relationship between parenting and children's recovery after a traumatic event. We recruited 35 moms and their children from battered women's shelters and from the courts, the Hennepin County Courts. And we followed them over a five-month period where we invited them to come into a community setting, actually it was a shelter, three times. And um, what we found was that you couldn't be, um, you couldn't participate in the study unless your child had actually witnessed the, a domestic violence event. So the, the, the key criterion for participation was that the, the, there had to be an incident of domestic violence, the adult caregiver had to be the victim, and the child had to be present. And from the time that we recruited the families till the time they came in for their first interview, on average, people came into their first interview three months after the event, I'm sorry, three weeks after the event, so very soon after. Within 21 days, we still had a handful of moms who said to us, oh, no, no, she didn't see anything. <laughs> he didn't see anything. And we had to remind them that in order to participate, they had to have seen. But it's very, very common, we see this often when you look at police reports, that in the immediate time when the police report will tell you one thing and then you know, several months later, a parent will say something else. And it's often because parents want to protect their children and they don't want to think that they're... It's very hard to imagine that your child's seen something really awful. It's really a terrible thing. Um, and there's pragmatic concern about child protection involvement. Um, what we found in that study, by the way, was that there was a strong discrepancy between parent and child report of the child's symptoms. So, um, so it is very important to... Um, to get as broad a range of information as you can. Um, so, um, just briefly, um, in terms of assessment, you, you can choose to do it various ways, but it is important specifically to assess for trauma. Um, this could be done in different, uh, you know, different contexts. Some, you know, every system does it differently, whether it's a triage unit or a provider or a uh, the clinician who's going to do the therapy, who doesn't do the intake, things like that. Um, and um, I'm not going to spend much time talking about what it means to become trauma-informed in an organization, if you're interested. I can certainly discuss that. We can certainly discuss that afterwards. It is important to use standardized instruments because that way you can compare a child to the population of kids on whom the instrument's been normed. And there are now good tools for measuring uh, both exposure and symptoms. We'll talk about that in the next slide. And we are just beginning to be able to, um, to complete assessments online. And I don't know whether you're going to touch on that, David, but, you know, if people are intrigued, we can talk about that. And that's where you get imme feed feedback immediately from, you know, it's nice when the child is able to answer a questionnaire and then, whoop, there come, there come, the results come back. There are two key variables to assess when we're assessing exposure to trauma and violence. One is history and the other is symptoms. Without history, you don't, know, you don't know what those symptoms mean. So you need to know the context from which the child is reporting symptoms. And um, I'm getting a little technical, so um, I won't go into the kinds of scales that I have uh, listed here, but there are several. Um, for assessing post-traumatic stress disorder specifically, um, you can use standardized instruments or a clinical interview um, a clinical interview is generally considered to be the gold standard for um, assessing post-traumatic stress disorder, but a lot of people do do it by using standardized instruments like the Post-Traumatic Stress Disorder Reaction Inventory by Bob Pinus and colleagues um, in uh, UCLA, or sometimes called the UCLA Post-Traumatic Stress Disorder Inventory for the DSM. And like I said, you should directly ask children who are seven and older about their symptoms. Um, wow, I finished with three minutes to spare, five minutes to spare. So, um, you know, 
you know, maybe I'll just take two minutes to um, just to give you a sense of what these what these instruments do. If you're interested, um, it's hard to assess children's exposure. Think about the fact. Think about how complex history is. Um, we want to know how many traumatic events a child's been exposed to in their life. We want to know what traumatic event, events they've been exposed to. And we want to know how severe their exposure is. And those are the kinds of things that we need to know when we're learning about history of exposure. And so uh, a good history, uh, the, the, um, the VEX, the Vance Exposure Scale, and the things I've seen and heard are actually developed for younger children. The things, both of them are pictorial scales. Um, the uh, things I have seen and heard um, actually was developed for that study of community violence that I told you about that John Richter's and Pedro Martinez uh, conducted in Washington, D.C. in uh, the early 90s. And basically, um, that is just a very straightforward. It says, um, you know, uh, um, you know uh, starts by making sure the child understands the scale, uh, say, saying something like, um, you know, have you had ice cream? Have you ever eaten ice cream? And then the child, simply there's a blobs to indicate the amount of times that the child's eaten ice cream. You know, zero, which is an empty circle, then one, which is one black blob, two, three, four, five or more times. And then you ask the child about the kinds of events they might have witnessed. Um, and then it includes positive and negative. So, for example, uh, how often have you seen adults in your home being nice to each other? How often have adults been nice to you, as well as the kinds of traumatic events like adults yelling at each other, adults hurting one another. Um, I've seen a, there's things like I've seen a dead body, um, people I've seen a shooting, things like that. Um, and then um, for symptoms, um, if we take um, a PTSD reaction index, for example, in that one measure, uh, there's, there are questions both about exposure, what you've seen, and then the child is asked um, to, uh, to select the event that, um, that is causing, that, that really has impacted them the most. So they choose one event, and in regard to that particular event, they're asked to list the kind of th symptoms that they're experiencing. And um, they're asked, I think uh, uh, David has a little, has a slide um, if, on it if you're interested, but um, they're asked about time frame and they're asked about severity of symptoms. And so it's really, really important to look at both of these elements of trauma, one of which is the history and the second of which is the symptoms. And the Levon, by the way, um, which is, goes with things I have seen and heard for young children because the, the, post, the, uh, the pie noose and the trauma symptom checklist really only normed for, for kids over the age of seven. The Levon can work with younger children. We've seen it work with children as young as five. And that has a little, a little stick figure, um, a little boy of indeterminate race and sort of youngish kid whose name is Levon. And um, the child is asked on each on each item, how often he or she has felt like Levon. And so it will say, um, you know, Levon is sitting in class, and there'll be a picture of this little boy, and a classroom and a teacher, and the little boy staring out the window, and it will say, Levon is sitting in, in class, and he has a hard time he listening to what the pet teacher's saying. How often have you felt like Levon? And then the child will respond on a scale of, um, of uh, one to four, based on severity. So um, that's just a little introduction since we had like a couple of extra minutes to a trauma and assessment. When we come back from our break, we'll take a 10-minute break. When we come back, David will um, talk about um, the case, and then I'm going to just spend a few minutes talking about more broadly about interventions, and then we'll have time for Q&A. So I encourage you to start thinking about your questions. Okay, thank you. <laughs> 